One very briefly, where does this leave the two-track process that was ongoing, the discussions on the the two working groups that were going on, which have been continued by the Copenhagen they, conference? They, they, will be, they, will, they will continue. Uh, they will continue, but is there a point? They will continue, but there was talk, or there is talk, uh, that there should be a legally binding agreement in 2010. Even if that not, does not happen, there's a review arrangement before 2012. Right before 2015, sorry, right. and the Kyoto Protocol comes to an end in 2012. Right. My own take on this is that as time goes on, there will be some kind of a consensus that let the Kyoto Protocol have a natural death and something else will emerge in its place, okay. if not by 2012, but certainly around 2015. And you think the two working groups will start addressing that? The two working groups... Because by um, mandate, they are bound to... Again, uh, that is something that we will need to closely watch, because it could be that these political decisions are taken outside the UN framework, right. and they come back to the UN framework for ratification or for working out of the details. Right. But I also get a feeling that the other developing countries will soon see and this is how, and it all depends on how the basic group of countries, particularly China, play their cards. If they are espousing the cause of the de other developing countries, particularly in adaptation, then they will go along. One of the things uh, spoken about a lot at the conference was that uh, the UN process uh, mandating consensus and taking everybody along doesn't seem to have uh, succeeded. Uh, the Copenhagen conference in some sense was therefore a failure, but a large number of civil society groups and NGOs have hailed what they considered to be a gathering momentum, uh, at least in civil society, uh, towards climate solutions. Uh, whatever one may uh, feel about civil society groups as a whole in their response to the climate uh, problem, in the run-up to Mexico, uh, while the governmental negotiations take place, what do you think is going to be the role, or you would like to see, the role of civil society groups in this process? The big shift which I saw in the run-up to, uh, to Copenhagen was at Barcelona, when the African group actually walked out. Because they said that the developed countries, particularly the parties to the Kyoto Protocol were not putting any numbers on the table as to their reductions and they walked out. Now that show of uh, defiance in a way of the process was important because nobody expected Africa to take that kind of stand. So what is, what, what is the, the role that civil society can play is to support uh, the, the least developed countries in understanding this problem because when I spoke to the African uh, de delegates there, they were very categorical in saying that, look, we have a political mandate to do this because we are already feeling the problems of cl climate change, the drought in Darfur and Kenya and the entire sub-Saharan belt. So civil society can play a role in sensitizing these people that, look, the issue is not just about climate change but also about its adverse effects. Right. That is one role. So that this perspective is not lost sight of that the big countries have a deal among themselves and forget about the small guys because ultimately it's a, it's a global concern. The other role they can play is to, and I suspect they will start playing this role is, to highlight this issue of numbers. Because yeah. now that everybody has agreed to take on commitments, basically, right. or some actions, the developing countries have also agreed to take on actions of a different kind and of a different nature and of a different degree. So they can start highlighting these issues, what this means for the domestic constituencies. For example, we need a debate in India as to what will be the impact of climate change on us, which we are not really aware of, and if we take steps to deal with this issue, where will the burden fall or what will the burden be, which are the sectors, which are the states, which are the citizen, groups of citizens or localities that will need to make a change in their lifestyles. I think this debate has not taken place in developing countries and one outcome that the accord is likely to be a domestic debate about this. Right. It's only when there is a domestic debate can you have an international agreement because an international agreement or commitment will have to be based on a domestic debate. Right. And this will in turn put pressure because if these civil society groups link with their counterparts, United States, America and Japan, there can be a useful exchange of experiences and ideas which will again help to set up some kind of a parallel process of an informal process right. which would Exert influence, influence on, the, on the multilateral process right. and on the political process. Because right. I think you need all three. Sure. Because then the last point I want to make is that 
the experience or the statistics that coming, are coming out of Europe and North America are that emissions from manufacturing have been steady since 1992. Yeah. It is the uh, consumption patterns that are driving up emissions in America and, and, uh, and Europe. It is the transportation and residential sector, the small, small appliances. Now for that, they are also recognizing that the solutions do not lie only in technological change, but also behavioral change. Sure. Now if behavioral change is going to be a big feature in dealing with climate change, civil society has to get involved. Coming to the targets announced by large developing countries, China and India have announced their targets in terms of carbon intensity or emissions intensity. Do you think that is a useful metric uh, to use or would it be better to calibrate it in terms of emission reductions below projected growth rates or below BAU or? No, they, you could have, I think politically they felt that they cannot give a number because you cannot calculate a number. Right. You don't know what kind of growth you were where the growth is going to take you, what new technologies are going to emerge, what are the, going to be the costs involved. So this emanated from the Chinese. They're, in fact, their current national plan provides. They had said the national plan provided for 25 percent and now they've gone up to 40 percent. Yeah. Because they have achieved a level of economic growth, uh, particularly in the manufacturing sector. Close to saturation. Year, close to saturation level. Their electricity use per capita is that is equal to the world average. Sure. We are one third of that. That's right. So they are in a position to say that now we need, need to start looking at stabilizing right. the use of energy. Sure. And for them it made sense to look at this in terms of carbon because they have been using a lot of the coal. That's right. But for us? But for us, I'm not sure carbon was the right metric to follow. We should have used energy, right. which is what our national action plan says. Our national action plan says that the basic thrust would be on demand side management and energy efficiency. Right. That is what we should have projected there rather than take it in terms of carbon, because as our manufacturing industries are going to grow to provide That's employment, right. as our electricity generation based on coal pl 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 plants is going to grow, our carbon intensity is going to increase. That's right. Now the facts again show that in the last three, four years, when Chinese uh, electricity uh, generation capacity increased uh, tremendously and their manufacturing capacity increased tremendously, the, 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 the decline in carbon intensity of GDP actually came, uh, went up. Sure. The, the decline for, was For reduced. a short time. For a short time. Yeah. Now that is the kind of situation we are going to face for some time to for come. Some time. So we may be having a problem, not in this round, but when the next round of negotiations comes and people ask us to take further cuts, then we may have a big problem. In the run-up to Mexico, given where you started, which was that in some sense perhaps there was a misreading certainly on the part of India, maybe on the part of the other large developing countries as well, as to the mood of the smaller developing countries, the least developed countries, the island states, how they perceived the problem. What do you think India should do diplomatically, strategically in the climate negotiations in the one year ahead? Now you see, in, in India is going to face two or three problems. One is that by the end of January, we have to make a declaration right. as to what our commitment is. Right. The way we phrase that commitment is going to be very important. Right. Because what developed countries have done is that all their commitments are specifically in terms of data and numbers. Right. So they want you to scrutinize the data rather than the policy. Sure. They also have a benchmark against which you will assess it. Now if the benchmark is equal per capita emissions or burden creating criteria, we are safe. The other issue is about the LDCs. And we are particularly vulnerable not only because we, of the solidarity of the G77, but because we are surrounded by LDCs in our region. Right. You know, Afghanistan, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bangladesh Maldives. Maldives. So we have to be sensitive to their concerns, not only because of the climate region, but because of our own regional right. location. Now, their concern basically is that these guys are growing, their emissions are also causing problems for me, right. not just the uh, emissions from Europe or North America, but sure. also from India. Sure. So we will have to be flexible in terms of finance. I would say that the time has come for countries like China and India, and Chinese made that statement yes. there. At the let, the money, of, yes. let the money go to the LDCs. That's right, but India hasn't yet. Has not said it. I think we will not lose or we will gain a lot if we say that two thirds of the resources of the global environment facility should go to the LDCs for adaptation. Right. I think it would be a very good move on our part because we're not going to get that money in any case. If you make a voluntary commitment, you are not eligible to get money. Right. Similarly about technology, we talk about energy technology. I think the time has come to talk about the new varieties of seeds. Sure. Because for Africa, 
you need for new seed varieties for adaptation. So once if we show a certain amount of sensitivity, and it will not hurt our interests, it will only further our interests, particularly India's, I think it can, it can go a long way to maintain the solidarity of the G77, plus make sure that the LDCs also have a stake in this climate accord and not just in the Millennium Development Goals. Because you will not able to be able to meet the Millennium Development Goals if you don't take care of energy and agriculture, food security. Thank you very much, Mukul, for this very interesting discussion and for having brought out a uh, rather unfamiliar perspective in the post-Copenhagen discussions that uh, it's perhaps not so useful to look at things in black and whites, but to look more carefully at the greys.